Hello everyone, this is Shydrill, and welcome back to a video I know I have not uploaded in a long time, and that is entirely my fault. I have been busy with schoolwork, and kind of meant to get around to filming some stuff lately, but that's beside the point. I forgot, and that didn't end up happening. So here's the video now. Uh, something quick and dirty just tied you guys over. Hopefully tomorrow I will be recording my 100 subscriber special, so stay tuned for that. This video is something a little different. It is a Minecraft Redstone computer that I built. Didn't design it. This design is actually um, based off of one constructed by Noob Asaurus. I will link him down in the description. This is a computer I built called Citadel 1. Citadel 0 was something I did build, um, but <clears throat> then my Windows install broke and I had to wipe my hard drive, so Citadel Zero is gone, dead, no more. Uh, Citadel One is here and looking even better than Citadel Zero did. So I'll give a quick rundown of the specs so anyone who's interested but not interested enough to hear how it works can stay and hear that and then leave. This is a 16 bit computer, which means it can process numbers as high as 3000 or as low as negative 3000. That's a rough estimate. I can't do the math in my head. Um, this is the ALU. It does math in binary. can add, subtract, compare numbers. These are something called flags, which store the information about the number being displayed. Like, is it negative? Is it too huge for the computer to handle? Or is it zero? It stores that information, and it can use that to judge what the program should do. Here's the registry. 8 bytes, which means it can store 8 different numbers. And this information is used within the ALU for calculating stuff. ALU does the math, registry serves that information to the ALU, and the ALU can write information to the registry. Moving on, down here we have our immediate data, which is basically just information that the program memory here can serve directly into the registry or the ALU. <clears throat> this is not information that the pro program is able to modify, but the benefit of having that is we can just, we have less space used up in the registry if we have a value that we need to keep referring to but we never need to alter. Here in purple is the memory, random access memory, 32 bytes. Um, <clears throat> it's just for storing local variables and things that the computer doesn't need to use um, outside of a specific subroutine. Anyway, this is the RAM, and the address for the memory, the RAM access memory, is controlled here but by values stored in the 8th register. It's called register 7 because it starts with 0. Anyway, that information is stored in register 7, register 8, I don't know. And that address is used to choose which module of RAM uh, stores that information. So it's good if you just want to temporarily toss a value in there for quick storage if you want to reference it later. RAM is single read which means that it can only read through one output bus, that's fine. Registry is dual read which means it can serve through both buses, bus A or bus B, meaning we can perform an operation on the same exact bit or the same exact byte, it doesn't have to be two separate bytes, it can be the same byte. As a result, the registry is a lot bulkier. The RAMs are more compact. It's slower, but more compact. This here is our program counter. It counts to the next step in the program. It's just a binary counter. Um, depending on what we get from the program memory, we can also jump to another value um, in the counter, which means jumping to a line in the program memory respective to that value. We can just induce this value by either it coming out of the registry and firing these pistons that just changes the state of these repeater cells or we can take that value from the second input bus of the registry feed that directly in through a series of multiplexers and whatnot this value gets sent to the address decoder for program memory each of these lines is a line of code it may not look like it because there's nothing here other than a single torch I'm not sure what that torch is doing uh, but every single line of this program memory does something. And you do this by placing torches over the lines you want to activate when that line is run. 
So for example, if I wanted to write a number into the registry right here, I would just find the right line, which is right here, and I would put a torch here. So whatever number is being displayed across the output bus would be written to the registry when the first line of programming runs. And that controls basically everything in the computer, from the ALU functions to the program counter, to the registry, to the uh, RAM, to the program memory, uh, wait, this is the program memory, to the immediate data, to the I.O. Pink here is I.O. Uses the same address as RAM, except when I.O. is activated, it just turns off the RAM, turns on the I.O. This is called memory mapped I.O. This is not a new concept. Intel, believe, in invented it, maybe? Probably invented it. And that manages all the I.O. devices. I want to add a graphical processor so it, the computer can display values in base 10 to the user, but I have not found a value that I, I mean, a design that I like. This is a random number generator that the computer can use to get random values to use in programs. Uh, somewhat original design. Whatever bits are set to 1, it will use those bits as a mask to generate that number. So if bits 1, 2, and 3 are on, only bits 1, 2, and 3 will return with a random number. And over here is the biggest part of the project that I have mostly designed, and that is the hard drive. Now with memory, you don't have to worry about where the next open block is because you're only storing individual bits of data, not gigantic files. But when you're storing a gigantic file that contains multiple blocks of data, you need a bit of accounting for that. You need to know where every single block is and what file it belongs to. So that requires some extra circuitry, which I designed and built. And as you can see, Despite the computer being a 16-bit computer, it contains 22 bits of information width per block. And that is because there's a 6-byte, no, 6-bit address block right here. And what that does is, and we'll explain that shortly, but um, when you're storing a file, you have multiple blocks of information. The computer needs to know where the next block of information is. So every block has a pointer in these six bits, which will tell the computer the next address at the next block in the file. And that's called an address pointer. And the way that works is called a linked list file system. You can go on Wikipedia and look that up. I will also put information on this down in the description. But this is a linked list file system where every single block has directions to the next block. It's like a trail of breadcrumbs. And that value is automatically calculated by a circuit I designed down here. This is the storage allocator. It's a specialized circuit that will detect the first active output in a series of parallel outputs. For example, all these outputs are on, which means all of the blocks are empty. But it only gives us block number one, because block number one is the first empty block. If I were to get rid of these, um, you would see that this turns on because this block is available but this block is also available but it doesn't turn on because the storage allocator is doing its job correctly this lets us find the first open and usable block in the hard drive for when we were writing a file and this address gets put out to the address bus for the address pointer block here in the hard drive and the address pointer of the current block is read and put in this buffer registry and this just temporarily stores things so that on the next read it will read from the next used block and all the way at the end I have an additional 16 bytes of data these will not store files but rather file names in the starting positions of each of those files and that is called the file table and again, this is a similar storage allocator, which points the first empty storage block in the drive. But this time it just points to the first empty block in the file table. And so that allows us to store up to 16 separate files, um, which means that they would have a total length, each file length would have a total of uh, three bits 
no, three bytes, and then an end of file flag. Now we need that end of file flag so that the computer knows when to break out of an instruction loop to read from the hard drive. And the address will be automatically controlled by uh, a counter circuit somewhere in the computer. I'll figure that out eventually. So when we are storing a file, we send the computer a file name. That's all it really needs to send. It sends that information all the way down to the file table down there. And the file table stores that file name. And thus, the computer will choose the um, first open block on the file table and say, OK, store it here. Stores it to the first open block of the file table. It locates the first open block in the storage block and stores that address here. And that's our start address. And then it stores the first value of the file, first set of bits. That gets stored to the first open block in the data block. And then the address of the next open block gets stored to that block. So you have your linked list, where every single block points to the next block in the same file. And this is all done automatically by the circuitry that I developed and built here, which I decided to name Slap File System or Scrap File System, one of those. Um, self loading address pointer or self calculating and registering address pointers, one of those. I decided it needed a funny name since I designed it. Essentially, it's an overcomplicated linked list where everything is done by hardware instead of software. But having everything done by hardware simplifies the need for further program memory here. Um, this has gone through quite a few design iterations and it's not even finished yet. Currently, um, it still does not have the wiring needed to trigger reading and writing, so I will work on that eventually and get that done. Another thing that I figured that I could do if I wanted to increase the ability of this computer is install a CD-ROM, or a CD-read-only memory. Now, in Minecraft, cauldrons are really interesting blocks. A cauldron, right? We got a cauldron, we got a comparator. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. We've got our cauldron, and we've got a block of water in our cauldron. Okay, never mind. This actually simplifies things. I was going off the assumption that it would go from 0 to 15, but no, nope, it goes from 0 to 3. So 0 to 3 means we have four total bits. So if we wanted 16 bits of data with, we would just need four cauldrons. So we take out one bottle of water, gives us two. Take out another, gives us one. Take out another, that gives us zero. So, what does this mean? This means that if we have a rotating barrel of cauldrons, each of them storing four bits of data, that is a nice compact way to get us an invariably long amount of read-only data. And I find that to be a rather interesting concept because that would allow us to store programs on it and we could just run those programs based off of that information. And we could even run those programs based off of information supplied to the immediate data by the program. So we could have our own CD drive which runs everything based off of read-only cauldron memory. And it would be really compact considering the size of a cauldron. Anyway, that is Citadel 1, the Minecraft Redstone computer. If you guys like the video and if it gets a ton of inf uh, attention, I might uh, I might consider doing some updates and updating you guys and keeping you all informed of all the developments made as I continue to work out the file system and uh, eventually add a CD-ROM and a graphics, graphics processor. Uh, I hope you guys very much enjoyed the video and I will see you guys later, hopefully. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to, oh God, I'm saying it, aren't I? I'm saying Be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel for more horrible content. Uh, take care, thank you so much.